Space Preservation Commission and I'm happy to have you here and um, we presented the, the caterpillar lab today we had over a hundred people visiting the live caterpillar exhibit and now um, this is part of uh, a program the third of three programs the Open Space Preservation Commission has been involved with um, the two first ones we co-sponsored with the Stewardship Committee on um, Focusing on pollinators and natural habitat, what our species are like that we want to ensure we're not wiping off the face of the planet with our, you know, our backyard activities even, and what we want to protect on our conservation land as well. So first, I'd like to thank you for coming, and then introduce Sam Jaffe, who is a New England-based naturalist, photographer, and educator who has been worked with native insects since a very early age. He grew up in Eastern Mass, chasing birds, mucking through ponds, and turning over leaves. For the past seven years, he has been photographing caterpillars and organizing programs to promote these special creatures to the public. In 2003, he founded the Caterpillar Lab in Keene, New Hampshire, and he now travels across the country working with museums, nature centers, schools, and individual teachers helping native insects find their place in our everyday lives. When he's not behind the camera or tending his zoo of caterpillars, you can invariably find Sam up to his waist in vegetation. <laughs> so I'll turn it over to Sam. We're really happy to have you here tonight. Thanks. Um, we should try and get the lights over the screen there just so we can see the slides. Uh, hi, everybody. So did you all get a chance to walk through the caterpillar lab there? Cool. Um, uh, that should be fine. Can you guys all see that? Okay. Cool. Uh, I always like to start out and just find out a little bit about what uh, sort of what you're here for and what you'd like to know about caterpillars. So I heard some things already that there's a curiosity about maybe what makes a good caterpillar or a bad caterpillar. And I, I definitely plan to address that. Actually, I'm going to talk about a lot of caterpillars which we've labeled as bad caterpillars and maybe look for some of the positive things there. Um, but is there anything else, anybody with a burning question or just a curiosity that they want to voice? Or? What's the worst they can do to you? Okay, so like rashes stinging rashes? Sting. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about that. I've got a good, a good slide that we can mention some of the defenses that could uh, actually defend against us as well. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Having been to see your artwork at an art museum, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, I can do that. Um, so that's actually good. I'll, I'll start with a little bit of, of my own history uh, with these insects and tell you about how uh, what was going on in the other room sort of, sort of came to be. Um, and then I'll move on and, and talk about why I think caterpillars are special and what makes them special. And um, we'll end with a discussion of a few of these backyard species um, and trying to investigate uh, some of the, the inherent value in them. Um, but uh, I think many of us might be able to think back to some moment where they were inspired by nature or inspired to start learning more about nature. And when I was a little kid, I would bring caterpillars in from outside, uh, apparently as early as when I was three years old. And my parents would just find them crawling around the house because I had brought them in. Um, but we were having a pasta dinner one night, and my mother was making pesto and brought in, I think, some parsley with black swallowtail caterpillars on it. And they were just about to go in the cuisine art, and she stepped in and, and saved the caterpillars. So uh, that was my very first experience raising caterpillars. We set them up in a tank, and um, my dad, who's a physicist and a researcher, brought in this scientific perspective. So we were measuring them and rearing them and we had to make chrysalis on different colored crayons to see the different colored chrysalis and he was teaching me and these were you know he would tell me what was going to happen and then it happened and it was a great experience but what stuck out was um, one morning after they had become chrysalis came downstairs and I was waiting for that swallowtail butterfly to emerge as my father had told me it would 
and all of a sudden there are these little red pinchers out the side of the chrysalis. And as I'm watching, a wasp bore a hole in the side of the chrysalis, stuck its head out, and then ended up emerging and drying its wings. And these are the trogus wasps. Um, now you could think of that as sort of a horrifying experience, but to me um, it was sort of magical because it was completely unexpected. My father didn't know about it, and believe me, my father knows pretty much everything. So <laughs> it was really a nice, a nice turn on that. Um, and it also just it was one of my earliest memories of knowing nature as something that was never going to stop surprising me. So it really became a passion early on for me to get out um, in the field. And this is in Newton, Massachusetts, so the field is Cold Spring Park and just sort of basic suburb parks and discover things. Um, and I discovered a lot. And through my childhood, I felt like it was gathering, amassing secrets about nature, amassing things that other people didn't know about, which was, again, very empowering. Um, but eventually, I started to realize that other people didn't know about these creatures and that I could share my love, my interest, and my knowledge about them. And this really took off in 2008 when I started taking photographs and showing the photographs. So these are just some, some photos of native caterpillars. And I'd show these in galleries and in offices, and I'd end up standing by them during openings and just talking endlessly about these creatures that, that I loved. And it turned out that people really didn't know about. So one of the first things I'd always hear is, I can't believe that these things are native, that these are here. And it's not only that they're native, but most of these caterpillars just in this shot are things that you can find in most backyards. I mean, if the plants are there, those caterpillars will be there. And um, you know, I'd get into conversations about conservation. I'd get into conversations about the value of native green spaces or evolutionary biology or defensive adaptations. And it just became addictive to want to share all of this stuff. Um, so very quickly, uh, I took the next step and started bringing in live animals to my openings. So forget about wine and cheese, although I think we had wine and cheese at this particular one, uh, but wine and cheese and caterpillars. So I had been photographing all of these. I had them at home. Here was an opportunity to, to share. And from the very first show, it was just totally obvious that this was going to be a big hit, that this was something powerful. Um, people just adored the caterpillars. Uh, they rushed to the tables. The kids would be super excited at something new. Parents who might have held back and had old assumptions about these creatures would go forward and, and maybe try something new because of their kids. And grandparents would share stories from long ago of luna moths or monarch butterflies. And we just ended up with this dynamic program from day one. And um, in many ways, the, the base program we do hasn't changed. Uh, this is what led to the foundation of the Caterpillar Lab and um, all these other people who wanted to do this work with me. Um, but open air displays, a diversity of species out on the table, and just free exploration, uh, hopefully linked to having people go home and, and look in the backyards for themselves. And that's what this was all about. Um, so this is just one of the first big caterpillar lab shows at the Boston Children's Museum and just shows some of the dynamic uh, sort of discoveries being made. One of the real joys about this, again, with sort of sharing all these secrets, is taking something um, and getting to tell their stories. So I recently did a talk at an opening of a new native butterfly house in Cape Cod, and it struck me that often when you go to a butterfly house, you go through and it's like you're seeing a bunch of, of photographs. You're seeing the final product at this moment in time, and it's wonderful to be surrounded by butterflies and have them land on you. But very rarely do you go through a butterfly house um, encouraged to think about what came before and what will come after. What are the stories of these creatures you're seeing? Um, and I felt like I could take all of these creatures, often uh, butterfly caterpillars. Actually, there's a little tiger swallowtail caterpillar right there. <laughs> and you know, tell the entire history and, and get people thinking about the butterfly that was choosing a place to lay an egg, the caterpillar that ate the eggshell and emerged, that survived the parasitoids and the birds and grew. And, you know, where I found it and where they can find it and what it's going to turn into. So telling stories was a huge part of this. Um, but through all of this, you got to wonder, like, why are caterpillars special? I mean, here we have a table of caterpillars, and people are going crazy over them. What is it that captures our imaginations? What is it that draws people into these discussions? Um, and 
I've come up with a number of answers over the years. I'd be interested to see if, if you guys can add to that. But um, one thing that, that stands out immediately is um, that caterpillars are juvenile organisms, right? So they're all growing up towards something else. They're going to become one day a pupa and then an adult butterfly or moth. Now, most animals have to be true to form from day one. Our children have to look somewhat like us. They're going to develop smoothly into our form. Um, maybe they would be better off if we just laid eggs in a pond and had our children as tadpoles, but, um, but we can't do that because we don't go through this process. Um, the adult butterflies and moths, they have to worry about a lot of things. They have to worry about finding a mate. They might have to worry about defending territory. They have to worry about defending themselves from predators. There are all these pressures on them, and they have to moderate them in their form. They have to be a good defensive animal. They have to be a good parent, a good mate. Um, and sometimes that means they have to make uh, compromises. So maybe they're not going to be the perfect sexy butterfly or the perfect defensive butterfly. Um, but a caterpillar is a juvenile organism. It doesn't have to think about mating. It doesn't have to think about defending territory. It has to do basically two things. Uh, who can help me out here? Eat. So that's like the very hungry caterpillar, right? We all know they have to eat. Eating is sort of simple. There are some neat stories with it, but you know they have a mouth with mandibles. They have a long digestive tract, and they poop. Um, so, you know, some caterpillars have larger heads to mount larger mandibles to eat better, but the story gets much more complicated with the other thing they have to do. So they have to eat, and what else? Yeah, they have to eventually grow up to turn into something else to survive. So they have to defend themselves. They have to eat and not be eaten. So what you see with caterpillars is you see pure defensive adaptations. They're not muddied by having to be a good competitor with their siblings. They're not muddied by having to be attractive to mates. They're just perfect defensive animals. So everything you see on a caterpillar except its mouth and its digestive tract ends up being defensive. The shape, the behaviors, the coloration. So here's a gray furcula caterpillar, one of my favorite native species that eats poplar. And right now it's rearing up, it's enlarged its thorax, it's gnashing its jaws, and it's inflated its final pair of pro legs into these two tassels, and it's waving them around like this as I'm taking a picture. And I'm not exactly sure how that defends it. Maybe it's a weird out defense if you're bold enough to eat it at that point. You, you deserve it <laughs> as a meal. Um, but it's certainly unique, and we see so many unique defenses, um, and a lot of these things end up making us laugh. And I've been curious about this recently. Why do, when we see a, a caterpillar that looks like a twig, so perfectly, you know, a twig against a plant, so many people chuckle when they see that, or react in an emotional way. So I haven't really figured out how that ties into our own experience, but mimicry and camouflage really gets people thinking and interested and invested. Um, I was just going to go through some of these crazy defenses. Um, this is another, all these caterpillars are native. This is the black dotted prominent, often seen in power line cuts and dry areas. Um, what do you think this caterpillar uh, is capable of? What's it telling the world with these colors in this position? Come on, guys. It's powerful. Don't mess with me. Don't mess with me. It's being really loud, right? So it wants to be seen. It wants a blue jay to know long before it picks it up in its mouth that this caterpillar is full of toxic chemicals, that it's going to taste really bad or make it sick. It doesn't want the blue jay to discover that after it's in its mouth. It, we talk sometimes about birds having experiences with caterpillars. Oh, don't touch that one because it's going to make you sick because I already ate one. It's better if they can give that message beforehand. So we see that a lot. Um, and uh, this is definitely one of the better examples. So what's going on in this case? You can't see me. Yeah, so this is pretty classic camouflage. We have many, many uh, leaf mimic caterpillars in New England. And again, this is something that really makes people sort of chuckle or just um, stop and think. Um, different caterpillars on different leaves look differently. So this is on oak. It's got that dry sort of late season look to it. And here's a double toothed caterpillar on elm and anybody who's uh, looked up how to identify an elm might have read that you look for the double toothed leaf margin. Uh, teeth on teeth. 
Um, elm also stains purple when it gets damaged, so you can see the sort of purple feet that would match the stain of the leaf. So they're eating the leaf and then they're filling the leaf with their own bodies. And this sort of brings me to another reason I think caterpillars are really special. It's their incredibly close relationships um, with the plants they eat. So a lot of caterpillars are specialists. They'll eat only one group of plants. Um, you can guess by looking at an animal like this that it's going to eat elm and, and nothing else. Um, and you see that in the way they're designed. Um, you see that in the chemicals that the plants have in their leaves. So a lot of uh, defensive chemicals in plants, some that taste really, really good to us, uh, evolved in response to caterpillar herbivory. So we have caterpillars being affected by the plants they eat, the plants being affected by the caterpillar. Even basic leaf shape has been linked to herbivory. So some of these leaves that have deep cuts out of the leaves maybe get a caterpillar to only eat a section of that leaf before moving on because it's awkward to try and then go to the next cut. Um, leaves that stain colors when damaged may be advertising to birds that there's a caterpillar eating nearby. Um, so like the red bruising on a maple leaf. Um, so here's just another example. This is the four-horn sphinx. It's a, almost a four-inch long caterpillar. Um, definitely one of our more exotic species. You tend to find these in floodplains, places like Oxbow National Wildlife Refuge. Um, if you guys have any uh, stories about the caterpillars you're seeing, you're welcome to, to interact with this. But these come in green and brown forms. Um, and I do tend to find the brown forms clustered around the brown or dead leaves on the elm tree. Um, the elm sphinx or four horn sphinx. Um, sphinxes are like the tobacco hornworm uh, a lot of people have heard of, and that's just one example of about 40 species that are in the area. Nope, just resting there. And I, I do admit, you know, I took this photograph and I told those caterpillars that if they wanted to rest by the dead leaves, I'd appreciate it because I'm trying to tell the general story of what, what their camouflage is all about. Did you place them there? Um, yes, but um, so my photography is, is largely based and uh, influenced by old fashioned natural history artwork. And the, the, the idea with, with this, like Audubon's work, um, like um, Maria Sibylla Marion, who did life cycles in Suriname of butterflies and moths, the idea is to first and foremost highlight the animal's form. So it's not nature photography with a, a mountain in the back. We're really talking about the structure of the animal and then place it in a background or on a substrate that helps tell the story of the creature itself. So in this case, I'm very much asking people to recognize, you know, this, this is the story. This is its whole world right here, a couple of elm leaves, and the resemblance, the mirror of the leaves, really tells us something about how it survives. Um, so I do take liberties that I wouldn't expect someone who classifies themselves as a proper outdoor nature photographer to take, um, to tell that story. Um, Although this one, I didn't have to do much work on. So these are caterpillars that eat goldenrod flowers and live in goldenrod flowers. So you can see here that relationship with the plants, they eat really, really impacts the way caterpillars have evolved. Um, and again, the way plants have evolved. Here's sort of an extreme example. Uh, we had the BBC come to the caterpillar lab to film this species uh, over the last few years. It's a little caterpillar which is going to be active very, very soon um, on especially a daisy fleabane is a favorite flower of it. And it picks the petals or sometimes the whole flower heads of the plant it's on and sticks it to its back with silk. So if you see a little daisy fleabane walking across a stem, that's, that's, your, uh, that's your camouflage looper caterpillar. So you can either evolve to look like your surroundings or you can pick up your surroundings and stick them on your back. Has anyone seen these before? So this is a very common caterpillar, and I really encourage you to, you have to look for them, but uh, one of the best places I know of is just uh, Great Meadows in Concord. Do you know Great Meadows with the dike going across? Just search, uh, this time of year, search the daisy fleabane. You're looking for a different texture because it's taken all the petals and put it on its back, so it's more chaotic. And later in the year, you look on goldenrod. Um, they're only about uh, half inch, maybe three quarters of an inch, but for that size, their story is pretty fantastic. And they turn into a brilliant green little emerald moth. Um, this is going to be one of my favorite stories. This is a fourth instar, that means fourth growth stage, Abbott Sphinx caterpillar. And at this size, um, it mimics a sawfly larva. Does anyone know what a sawfly is? 
Yeah, so soft flies are the larva, a free living larva of a stingless wasp. And there's a lot of them out there. When I'm sent pictures to identify, usually they end up being soft fly larva. Um, and many of them are pretty noxious. And there's many of them that have this sort of downy blue appearance. And if you irritate them, they'll often regurgitate uh, orange stomach fluids. So this is a sphinx, like that tobacco hornworm again, but its horn has evolved into this little orange nubbin, which looks like a sawfly larva throwing up. And that spiral is classic sawfly. Now this animal is just getting on the big side for a sawfly, but this is gonna be a four and a half inch insect, a pretty big sphinx. This eats grape too, by the way. Um, so what's it gonna do when it gets way too big to be a sawfly? Well, shedding your skin can be an opportunity to completely switch your defensive adaptations. And this is how it ends. Um, this is the Abbott Sphinx, and it has a brilliant, shiny, false eye where that orange nubbin used to be. Um, green spots like grapes, although there's a brown form that just looks like bark. And it'll actually lift up that rear end, especially as it's nearing pupation, and sort of look around with it, and it can make a hissing, clicking noise as well. So. Um, so the rear end is the... Rear end is on my side over here, and the head is on the far side. Um, I, have a, I have a question. Sure. So thinking that if a bird is going to try to eat that, it's going to go from the bottom of the head to the top of the head, it's going to go for what the bird thinks is the head? I see. So this is actually, I think this is a powerful example. So caterpillars, if they get ruptured on their rear ends, they're just as likely to die as if they get ruptured up front. Um, so this is what we call predator mimicry. The idea here, and with the swallowtails with the false eyes on their back, is that a predator is going to see this and have to make a split-second decision. Is this food that I can eat, or is this a possible danger? If it's even asking that question, if a chickadee has to stop and think about that, um, think of what it will lose if it guesses wrong and that's actually a snake. It doesn't want to even chance it, uh, because the loss of fitness is complete. It, get eaten. Um, so even that one second hesitation might be enough just to have a go eat a caterpillar that doesn't have a false eye. Um, but we see, especially in the tropics, a huge number of predator mimics. And I think this should have us look differently sometimes at when we see false eyes on other animals and ask, OK, is it just distracting from the head? Is this a false head? Or is this predator mimicry? Um, but this caterpillar, I like to stop on this just for a minute, because as I was talking about, people couldn't believe that we had these species here. To me, an abbot sphinx is like finding some, it's what you'd expect to find in the middle of the Amazon, in the darkest jungles, and it would be quite a discovery. And you can turn over a leaf on a roadside pretty much anywhere around here at the right time of year, and you can find an abbot sphinx. And, and you're saying this is the same as the previous one? Yes. So, oops. Just a different, just a molted into the other. Yep. So shedding your skin, um, all of metamorphosis works basically through, through regrowth of skin and shedding, and it's an opportunity to change your defensive strategies. So that's what they're doing as they grow up. Um, this is another one with these inflatable tails. So these have these tassels. At first, they're a leaf mimic, but they can swing these tassels around. And we don't quite know how this works, but it may be that these inflated tails have chemical signals on them that tell a predator what's inside them, what they can expect if they were to take a bite and show that it's not so pleasant. Or it may just be really weird looking and sort of disconcerting. Um, so that's Serura. That's our, um, one of our prominents. And then we have caterpillars that are just so completely weird um, that it's hard to, hard to imagine them. This is the Harris's three spot. Um, we raise these every year. The caterpillar, at first look, is sort of just a piece of detritus or bird poop. Um, if you look directly at the rear end, that last segment's swollen into a huge head with two eye spots. And it's mimicking um, probably a specific jumping spider, Phytopus autex. And it'll lift that up, and it even uses its last pair of pro legs as little pinchers. Um, and then what's going on with the head? Can anyone tell me what's happening in the front of the caterpillar here? Any guesses? It's all black, so OK. <laughs> so caterpillars shed their skin to grow, right? And they also have to shed their old heads. Um, they grow a new head every time they shed. Um, so this caterpillar doesn't just discard them like waste, it wears them as a hat. So it's got <laughs> two instars previously head, heads on there. And if you give it a little tickle, it'll swing them back and forth like this and hit you with them. Um, so I hope you're seeing, like, these are really creative, pure, cool, charismatic, and inspiring defenses. And I really do think that 
caterpillars show this to a degree we don't see in other organisms, and part of that is that they don't have to sacrifice you know, the purity of defense to be able to grow into something that's also going to be a good candidate you know, for mating or for defending territory. Um, just a few others. This is the monkey slug caterpillar, which has often been likened to a, um, a shed tarantula skin, but we don't really know what's going on here. It's a legless caterpillar. And turbulent phosphilla. Um, do you guys know Smilax? Have you heard of Greenbrier? It's a thorn, thorny vine that grows around. It's not very uh, favored by gardeners because it can certainly uh, jab you pretty well. But uh, this is the host plant of this creature. Um, it's really hard to tell what you're looking like when you see 100 on a leaf. It's almost like a, a strange QR code just sticking out in nature somewhere. Um, and as you get closer to them, they start to wiggle a little bit. They turbulate hence turbulent phosphilla. So now you've got this wiggling black and white mess. Who knows what that is? Get even closer, maybe you blow on them, and every caterpillar jumps off the leaf and hangs by thread, wiggling, and they have bright orange bellies. So again, not sure what's going on here, but it's certainly a weird experience for any predator. Uh, we do see in nature um, stripes like this on zebras, for instance, where it's hard to tell where one animal ends and one begins. Maybe they're trying to look like a larger animal, something that a small bird couldn't handle. Um, but definitely one of my favorite caterpillars. This photograph was very tough to take because I had to be very close to the caterpillars, so it took me an entire day to sneak up on them very slowly so they wouldn't drop off. Um, and I took this in one shot because the flash made them all, all go. So. Not always easy working with insects. You have to be very, very patient. That's the best way to get good pictures. So um, that's sort of the end of the discussion of defensive adaptations. But I think there's something else that makes them very special, um, and maybe all insects special as an education tool, in that they lead very rapid lives with dramatic change. So we've talked already about metamorphosis separating the adult and larva. But if you were to have stayed the whole day at our tables there, you would have seen caterpillars eating and pooping. That's, that's easy. Building a cocoon, um, shedding their skin, a pupa that's developing into an adult. You can see more and more the wing patterns. And two uh, question mark butterflies that shed into chrysalis or pupa during the show. So things are always happening with these insects. And we can take these creatures out to the public and not just describe their lives, but actually have people witness their lives progressing. So, just the very idea of metamorphosis and change makes these really special animals to work with, makes them interesting. So I've got some videos here. I always like sharing our videos from the lab. This is one taken with our very first Cecropia of this season. And um, there's going to be a lot going on. So this is a caterpillar getting ready to shed its skin. Uh, it hasn't eaten for a while. It's been sitting here developing sort of new parts underneath the old. And the skin has now started to separate. You can see those white creases. In the old head capsule, you can see the mouth parts of the new head capsule mo even moving around, the antenna, the mandibles, the new eyes, the five eyes in the neck. This is one of the caterpillar's tubercles. You can see the old tubercles detached. The new one is sort of squishy and beneath it. These are some super close-up shots. Sometimes you get too close to something, and it can be a little disconcerting. But <laughs> This is the skin. You can see two layers. The spiracles, breathing holes for caterpillars, are too thick there. And here it goes. This is sped up four times. So these are moments that we can actually have happen at a show that we can witness every day and that I feel are really magical. It feels like you're seeing something incredibly rare. And yet, at the same time, this is happening all the time in the woods around us. So caterpillars are going through this dramatic, painful-looking process, coming out of their old skin, uh, pulling their old breathing tubes out of their bodies, which are being replaced by new ones. That's the white line you're seeing. And replacing their old head capsules. So as we walk through the forests, we're walking over leaf litter and caterpillar head capsules. I like to try and get people to think about all the things that we're not seeing that are happening nonetheless out there. So when you see a butterfly, flying through your yard, that also means there are five head capsules somewhere in the woods nearby from when that caterpillar was growing up.
So that was our Sucropia. Oh, one more thing. They can't really sense when they've finished shedding, so they always have to turn around and check their own rear ends to make sure that they were successful um, with their little antenna. So I can always call this at a show when something is shedding. Just say, and now it will check its rear end. <laughs> so have you seen this before? Have you seen anything like this before? I've seen it with a monarch. Mm -hmm. It's, it's so dramatic. Like, it's, it makes you wonder how metamorphosis could ever have become a thing. I mean, clearly there must be some great advantages to these changes in form because, you know, these are vulnerable and difficult moments for a caterpillar. Um, we had a caterpillar building a cocoon today. This is a time lapse of a silkworm um, building a cocoon in a toilet paper roll. <laughs> great for cocoon building sequences. Um, but again, this is just something that some caterpillar at the lab will always be working on while we're there. So we can invite people into these moments to see this. So in the wild, that would just be in the leaf litter? Well, for this particular species, Bombyx mori, there is no in the wild. These are factory animals at this point. So they're species that have been bred over 5,000 years to produce silk. Um, and they can't live outside. So they actually, you can't put them on a tree outside. They won't move correctly to find food. The moths can't mate without being very close together. Um, but other species um, often have very particular ways they'll build a cocoon in very particular spots. Um, now, of course, not all build cocoon, but it's all cocoons, sorry, but it's all leading up to pupation. So after they build a cocoon, the caterpillar will shed its skin into the next form. Other species will go underground to do this. Um, still others will go into a block of old wood. Um, we have a number, the Harris's three spot, bores into wood, makes little pom-pom balls out of the wood shavings and throws them out behind it so you get a little bunch of, of little spheres. Um, and butterflies don't do anything except string themselves up somewhere out in nature. Uh, a pupa um, is this middle stage. A chrysalis is still a pupa, but it's special because it's it becomes a pupa um, under the eyes of birds. So they have to be decorated, camouflaged in some way. Whereas moth pupa from species that are inside cocoons or underground don't really have any pressures on them to look anything other than just structurally like a pupa, like the form they need to be. So this is a Cecropia caterpillar, uh, those big green ones, after it's absorbed most of, uh, most of its skin again um, into a new layer beneath and it's shedding its uh, caterpillar skin away right now. So we're always trying to take videos of sort of this behind the scenes of what's happening out in nature. Um, and again, every butterfly and moth you see had to go through this process. Um, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people think pupa are like a case with a caterpillar inside that'll be growing wings. Um, in fact, the caterpillar is, all that's left of the caterpillar is the skin. As it sheds away, you're left with this entirely new form. And the pupa is actually much more moth or butterfly-like. So you can see the antenna. You can see the wing buds to the side. It's all the um, structure, the blueprints of the moth or butterfly to come. Move this ahead a little bit. So it's actually quite pretty once it's done. <laughs> it's that one, you know, middle time that it gets a little strange to look at. But and then this will harden and turn brown. And finally, well, how long does it take for? I guess it varies by species, but oh, it does vary. May or mm -hmm. it's a long setup, so it can be days of of building that new skin, becoming inactive, preparing. Um, but one of the reasons we don't see it that often is it happens very quickly once the skin starts to split. That could be five minutes, um, ten minutes. Uh, it varies at that stage. Some are very quick. Um, this is, uh, I'm going to start moving a little quicker through these, but this is just the final moment here. So this is the Cecropia again, which would normally be inside of a cocoon. Um, but this is happening uh, for butterflies from the chrysalis that are attached to leaves, for sphinx moths uh, deep underground, or for Cecropia from inside cocoons. In these cocoons, it just be 
Cecropia make their cocoons usually pretty low to the ground, not always, but they'll come down out of a cherry tree and find some brush or some, some twigs and make a cocoon. If they make it in the grass, it'll be a big bag cocoon through different you know, grass blades, um, or on a twig it might be just a spindle. The best time to look for these cocoons is during um, the winter. You can drive around and actually try and see these blobs in the trees. Um, and then they dry their wings, and this is just another big transformation that we often get to, to witness. Every day at open hours at the lab, we'll, we'll watch a moth dry its wings over the course of 20 to 40 minutes. Um, and uh, certainly, this is another creature worth uh, remarking that most people who experience New England and get used to the idea of living here, you know, just boring old New England would never really think that we've got these magnificent insects. I don't really think New England is boring, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you show someone a Cecropia moth and it'll really open up their eyes to what, what potential there is here. So that's the full lone Cecropia there. And we have those in the other, actually, I guess they've all gone home by now, but we had those in the other room. Um, and this is just at one of our shows showing this caterpillar is in the process of shedding its skin under the microscope projected up, and here's some kids watching it. Um, I'm going to skip this video, but this was a video we took at a show, again, of caterpillars hatching from eggs and got to see some things we didn't expect, um, just that these caterpillars hatch without antlers, and then they inflate them over time. So we're all watching this and discovering this together for the first time. So I hope I've sort of convinced you caterpillars are something special, um, at least as a, as a tool to inspire people to look at you know, our spaces around here a little differently. Um, but I wanted to talk about some sort of everyday caterpillars, many of which um, you may regard as, as pests or nuisances, and try and sort of tell you some of the stories that, that might be uh, ways that you can well, interact with them differently. Um, not that I'm a fan of winter moths, mind you. But uh, So has anyone seen this caterpillar before, the white mark tussock? It, yeah. it can have some outbreak years. It's, it's also debated whether this is a native species. It's been around for a long time, but it exists in Europe as well. And it might be a very early non-native introduction. Um, it's pretty cool. It's got all these different hairs. I think it's about seven different kinds of defensive hairs. Um, someone asked about... Uh, caterpillars that can irritate us, give us rashes. Um, these two little red glands on the back have a sort of irritant fluid on them. Think of it um, not quite like poison ivy uh, oil because it doesn't stay with you, but something that'll give you a similar reaction temporarily. Uh, when they shed their skin, they do this bizarre dance to rub all their hairs over those gla glands. They sort of do these back flips. Um, so their hairs are covered with this. And I don't personally react to these at all, but there are people who do, and there are also people who are allergic to caterpillars. So general rule of thumb, if you've got a hairy or spiny caterpillar, you want to know what it is before you touch it. Um, and any hairy or spiny caterpillar is potentially an allergic reaction um, uh, risk. Um, so if you've got kids especially, you want to have their first experience with a tent caterpillar be with one tent caterpillar under a controlled environment before they collect 600 in the backyard and dive into the bucket, uh, as, as kids have been known to do. Um, there are caterpillars which are like the hickory tussock, a white and black caterpillar, which are toted as extremely venomous and dangerous. Um, really, again, it's that sort of allergic reaction. More people get rashes from them, but not everybody does. So just take it slow. Um, there are specific caterpillars, some of the slug caterpillars, the io moths, um, and the um, flannel moth caterpillars from the coast, which can give you bad stings, painful stings. Um, but unless you're allergic, there's no caterpillar in New England that would send you to the hospital. But, you know, I'm allergic to peanuts, so I know what it's like, and you do want to watch out for that. Um, but the tussocks here is a story because I think it really... Um, it really reflects back to our sort of cycle of metamorphosis we just went through with the videos. Um, and maybe gives caterpillars um, uh, sort of, well, to, when you think of a caterpillar, most people think, well, this is just a, something on its way to being a butterfly or a moth. And I want to say that caterpillars are an important you know, stage in metamorphosis all by themselves, something that really impacts the whole creature's biology. And this caterpillar really helps us see that. So they have these spiny hairs that are irritating, lots of different types for lots of different defensive purposes. When they are ready to move on, they spin a cocoon 
but they give themselves a haircut and they weave all of those spines into the silk of the cocoon. So those spines defend the pupa, the next life stage. When the adult moth emerges, the female is wingless. This is the adult female fully formed right here. It looks like a little marshmallow with eyes. Um, and she lays her eggs right on the cocoon and she never leaves the cocoon. So she's protected by the caterpillar spines and the eggs are protected by the caterpillar spines. The species, uh, sorry, the genus name is Orgia because they, females call for males while they're still in the cocoon and usually 20, 30, 40 males will show up to a cocoon. It's quite a sight. Um, so she lays the eggs, the eggs hatch and the young caterpillars rest for a few days or a day on the actual cocoon with all those defensive hairs and then eventually they balloon away on silk. So here's a species where the caterpillar provides the defense for every other life stage. I think that's just a neat example of why we shouldn't think of caterpillars just as this in-between on your way, um, just as we probably shouldn't think of teenagers as just sort of in-between, give them some, yeah. <laughs> We were all teenagers once, right? We wouldn't want to be thought of as just on our way somewhere. Um, so who's seen tent caterpillars this year? <laughs> Yeah, it's been a weird year for them. There have been some areas that have been hard hit, every cherry tree is full of them, and some areas where it got too cold after a warm spell and most of the caterpillars died as they were hatching from their eggs. I got really excited about 10 caterpillars this year. I think they're fantastic. Um, a lot of people mistake them for gypsy moths, um, but whereas gypsy moths are non-native species that were introduced, tent caterpillars are native. They have a similar biology. They have boomer bust years. So there's years where we have tent caterpillars everywhere and they overwhelm all of their native predators and parasitoids. But years later, the predators and parasitoids, which will have done so well on these boom years, their populations are up and they keep tent caterpillars down. So our forests evolved with both forest tent caterpillars and eastern tent caterpillars and can handle those bad years. And maybe some weak trees die off. One of the complications is that we now do have gypsy moths and winter moths. So when tent caterpillars go out of control, they're just adding to this already stressed forest. Um, but they are creatures full of great stories. So this is just a sequence showing you what crazy eating machines they are. So just wait a little bit. This is them on their nest, a bunch of final instars. Now a caterpillar went out and it discovered there were some good leaves and it left a trail of silk back to the nest back to the colony, and that silk had a chemical on it that said, I found good stuff, go get it, guys. Um, and they followed that silk out, and then they each leave a trail of silk reporting on what kind of food they found. And once there's no more food left, the silk will basically close off those branches. It'll say, no more good food this way. So they're helping each other out. And it turns out these are pretty much the most highly social caterpillars on the planet. There really are no other caterpillars that not just live together, but communicate with each other about food sources, um, use each other in a big mass to sort of uh, do some climate control in that nest. They're able to position their bodies to warm up the, the colony. Um, so I found them quite fascinating and I was thinking, you know, teachers are always looking for monarchs in the fall um, or buying painted ladies in the winter in these little cups of mush. And there's all kinds of problems involved in that. The monarchs haven't been easy to find. Oops, sorry. Um, and so what could we do with tent caterpillars? I mean, they're everywhere, school's in session. You know, can you use tent caterpillars in a classroom? And I, I think absolutely. Um, I got this old book that's about this thick and it's all on tent caterpillars, nothing but tent caterpillars. Um, and it just is fascinating. Uh, there's a chapter on the parasitoids, the wasps and flies that use them. There are 54 species of native ichneumonid wasps. This is one group of wasps that use tent caterpillars and many of them only use tent caterpillars as a host. So basically tent caterpillars are a really entrenched part of our, our native ecology. Uh, there are cuckoo birds, black-billed and yellow-billed. Any birders out here? No birders, sorry. <laughs> uh, black-billed and yellow-billed cuckoos are these wonderful birds and they've actually evolved with tent caterpillars. They do something that few other birds do. They shed the lining of their stomach in the springtime as they're feeding so that all the hairs of the tent caterpillars, which irritate or make it so most birds can't eat them, are just shed out with the stomach lining and they can continue to eat them. So they open up these nests and eat all the tents. So when you see those tent caterpillars in your yard, just remember, even though you don't want them in your prized cherry tree, that they're part of a lot of things going on in our environment, and I think we should appreciate that. 
Well, in the Butterfly Walk this weekend, they were, uh, some of the folks were saying that there's a lot of reports about people seeing cuckoos this year. Mm -hmm. It's a big year for cuckoos. Yeah, we have a big so are there a lot of tent? There, there are in some areas, especially southeast Massachusetts, has a lot of tent caterpillars right now. But the cuckoos have also been thriving on the winter moths. Um, I've seen a lot of winter moths eaten by cuckoos. The timing is just right. So there's a start of something to be happy about with the winter moths if we have to find something. Um, but uh, just to finish this off, this is a, a cool little setup I saw in that book. Um, you don't want to have the nest actually part of the plant of the food that you're feeding them because they'll put all this web around everything and it becomes unmanageable. But you can create the nest as a separate entity over to the side and you um, put the main food in a vase and you can watch these caterpillars about once every six hours come out and build onto their web and then they go back inside and then they come out they build onto their web some more and then they go out on a little search party and the first ones find food they eat, they come back leaving the silk and the rest follow. And by the time a few days has gone by, there are these obvious silk trails going down. And I think there's just endless opportunities for these to be used in classrooms. You can rear them for a few weeks until they get too big and unmanageable and let them go. Or you can separate them out into individuals when they get big and have a caterpillar on every desk. But there's no reason that we have to only look to monarchs or only to um, Carolina biological supply uh, you know, uh, chrysalis and, and painted ladies. There's a lot of native creatures out there. And I'd love to promote things like Cecropia moths for classrooms, but sometimes you need to look for things that are, are always available right next door. And I think tent moths are that. Sorry for this picture. Uh, <laughs> got it off the web. Uh, this is in Massachusetts. This is just the winter moth hordes. So who's experienced winter moths here? Yeah. So I was pretty devastated uh, living in the Blue Hills about what they were doing. They were really uh, defoliating all the scrub oak up on top of the Blue Hills, so much so that there wasn't food for the native caterpillars. Um, definitely a problem. And there are people working on fixing this. Um, one thought is to release uh, parasitic wasps to take care of them, and we're doing that right now. Um, that has uh, many potential positives, but we have to be careful when we release non-native animals. I can talk about that in a little while. Um, but while we have them, what, what can we do with them? What can we enjoy from, from winter moths? Um, well, let me show you this video. Let's see. Okay, sorry. So living in the Blue Hills, I noticed that along parking lot edges, there were caterpillars everywhere that winter, oops, sorry, that didn't work. Sorry, starting over here. Um, that these edges of the parking lots were covered with winter moths. They'd come down out of the trees. Maybe they were looking to pupate, or maybe they had just finished the trees off, and they were wandering along these parking lot wooden barriers. But there were lots of other creatures there. There were spiders coursing along, eating them. There were stink bugs. There were ladybug larvae. Lots and lots of things eating these caterpillars um, in large amounts. Um, I saw an opossum come and just snarf up a bunch of them. It was a very fun scene. Um, but I started seeing these larger green caterpillars uh, that I'd never seen before. Here, we'll do a little music here. <laughs> so this is parking lot edges near the Blue Hills. This is actually Fagalia, not a winter moth, but it's a little bit bigger. And then a little banjo music to make it seem easier on people. Um, so it turns out we have these omnivorous caterpillars in New England. This is the ashen pinion. And they have done fantastic on winter moths. Um, you see them coursing up and down oak trees, going along these wooden barriers, picking off winter moths. And it was known that we had omnivorous caterpillars, but it wasn't witnessed all that often. Um, so last year, this time, we had a bunch of these for our shows, and whenever we went to eastern Massachusetts, we'd all go outside together and grab winter moths and feed them to the ashen pinions, and people got a kick out of that. Um, but generally, what I wanted to point out is that we have this invasive species, but it created this entire new sort of novel food chain happening in a parking lot in Milton and Reedville near Boston to witness and experience. And no, I don't like winter moths. I don't want them here. I hope that we are able to take care of them. Um, but I think that 
Although we want to tell people that this shouldn't be happening and what the problems are, we always want to celebrate the interesting moments as well. Because we want people to love nature, not fear it or be disgusted by it or think it's all at odds with what is natural and good. Does that make sense? <laughs> so this is the sushi roll part. Anyone had a caterpillar roll before? Okay. I'm very proud of this particular video. I have to say. All right, we'll spare you some more of that. All right, so who's had tobacco hornworms in their backyards before? Anyone grow tomatoes or peppers? So this is a pretty well-hated caterpillar um, by farmers everywhere um, and gardeners. Uh, but it is actually our, our largest native sphinx moth. So this is a, a big caterpillar, um, not quite as big as a scropia, but it gets there. Um, I think rather elegant. When you see them in the wild and you approach a tomato plant, they'll rear back on their hind legs and they swing their head back and forth, this sort of arching, uh, very dramatic animal. And um, pretty much at every farmer's market show we do, I make sure we have a tomato plant just being devastated by hornworms. It's uh, maybe not the best uh, impulse, but... Um, I discovered, you know, just like discovering this little uh, food chain on the parking lot barriers, I started going to these hoop houses at organic farms. It'd be a hoop house, they'd be growing tomatoes, getting them big early in the year. And you go into a hoop house and you see every life stage of hornworms. You find eggs that are hatching or you find eggs with tiny little parasitic wasps inside. They actually develop into adult wasps, dry their wings and are fully formed inside a single egg of a sphinx and then they come out, usually two. So you actually see these tiny little things flying around. Um, or caterpillars that had braconid wasps bursting out of their back, larva of these wasps coming out of their back after having fed inside the caterpillar. Um, they end up looking like little white cocoons. Some people think they're eggs on the back of, of these caterpillars. Um, you see healthy big caterpillars eating, crawling across the ground, going underground to pupate, and occasionally, if you're lucky, you'll see the adult moth, which is this beautiful insect. It's our largest sphinx. It's got a long tongue, um, three or four inches on the biggest ones, and it's the longest tongue of any flying insect here. So it's a pollinator on some plants that other insects can't get nectar from. So think of tobacco flowers with their long necks. And these look almost like bats, you know, big, fluffy, fuzzy sphinx moths that hover at flowers. So really something that I see sort of value and something to be proud of even as you're protecting your tomatoes. Um, there's also a second species, um, the actual tomato hornworm rather than the tobacco hornworm. And this second species is very rare now in New England. It may not even still be here. Uh, we've released all kinds of um, parasitoids to kill off the tobacco hornworm, which continues to thrive. Um, we put pesticides on our plants to protect them from tobacco hornworms, which continue to thrive. But the second species is being driven out of New England. It still has a stronghold in the Southwest. But it's sort of interesting to think about, you know, we're just protecting our tomatoes, but at the same time, there's another story going on, which is sort of the purposeful extinction, regional extinction of a, of a big, charismatic sphinx moth, the uh, tomato hornworm. Um, so um, one of the stories, um, well actually, so looking at the hoop houses again, a lot of farms are starting to have camps and programs surrounding them, there's community events. And one of what I consider it my job when talking with farmers is to try and encourage them to incorporate these creatures into those. Um, you can go through with a bunch of kids and pick off the tomato hornworms and feed them to the chickens. You can also bring them inside and rear them and go through that life cycle or see those dramatic moments of parasitism and learn about you know, what, what ecology is all about, all these connections. So I hope we'll see more of that. Um, but another story, I sort of touched on this earlier, is just, again, that close relationship between caterpillar and plant. So we like the taste of tomatoes. Why do we like the taste? What was there in a tomato plant, in this whole family, Solanaceae, in fact, that lends them well to being food for us? Well, the tastes that we enjoy are actually um, basically a side effect of the chemicals in the leaves that are there to defend the leaves against the caterpillars and other um, herbivores. So, the coevolution of tobacco hornworm and Solanaceae tomato plants has led to them being an interesting food for us. Just as this big uh, group of vegetables in the Brassicaceae, we're talking mustards and broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts, that sort of bitter taste 
those are chemicals which evolved in response to herbivory. So those cabbage white butterflies that eat our broccoli may be responsible for us having broccoli in the first place. And this is, of course, not going to save your plants, but it might make you smile as you flick a you know, cabbage white caterpillar off of your broccoli, I hope. Um, just a, a real quickie video of some happy hornworms. I mean, who doesn't love a happy tomato horn, tobacco hornworm? Um, they are actually really fantastic at eating. They have scoop-shaped mandibles where other caterpillars just cut a leaf. These ones can cut a leaf, but they can also use them like spoons. And um, unfortunately, that means they often think your finger is food. So this is a caterpillar which will nip you, thinking that your finger is tomato skin. Um, and this is just to show you, again, some of these things that you can see when you're sort of exploring a species up close, you know, forgetting it as a pest for a moment and looking a little closer at all the moments. This is a hornworm caterpillar, actually not a tobacco hornworm, but an apple sphinx, a hornworm uh, with braconid wasps emerging. And um, interestingly, these and other braconids spin cocoons really, really quickly after they emerge because they have to protect themselves from other parasitic wasps, which are looking to lay eggs in them. We call those hyperparasitoids, so parasitoids of parasitoids. It gets pretty layered like that. So I, this used to be sort of hard to watch for me, but, but now it, it's changing a little bit. I mean, number one, I see a bunch of really happy native little braconid wasps right there. So that's a good thing. Um, but also, in, in our programming, there's no better way I know to really exemplify what ecology is all about. All of these connections, all of these incredibly close relationships that lead to the diversity we see than, frankly, a parasitoid bursting out of a caterpillar, because this is as close as it gets. And that's uh, an old painting of this uh, adult tobacco hornworm with its tongue out there. Um, any questions so far? I'm, I'm, yeah, go ahead. Do all wasps have to be formed inside of caterpillars? Um, so no. Uh, we call these parasitoids. There's many wasp families that have members, or the whole family might need another organism to, to grow up inside. So they'll lay an egg in the caterpillar, or the beetle larva, or whatever their particular host is. And then the larva grow up inside. Some of the stories of these things are absolutely amazing. Um, there's competition over caterpillars uh, by these wasps. Maybe they're two different species that will lay in one type of caterpillar. So some of these wasps will have uh, lay two eggs, a male and a female egg. The female egg splits into hundreds of female larvae, which will grow up and they don't need a male to reproduce. Uh, but the male egg will grow into 10 much larger army cast parasitoids, which swim around inside the caterpillar and kill any foreign parasitoids from another species or another batch. So these stories are strange. But there are many wasps that will paralyze um, a prey item, bury it, lay an egg on it, sort of like parasitism, but they paralyze the, the creature first. And then there are wasps that don't do anything like this. So it's a pretty diverse group, just as the caterpillars are. Any other questions so far? Cool. Um, so I usually wrap up a talk with this sort of why should we care? And I hope I've given you lots of reasons to care already. But um, caring about caterpillars, it's, it's something, again, like a, a farmer at a farmer's market looking at these tobacco hornworms will say, yeah, try and make me care about these things. So well, first and foremost, I think they are just cool. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't need to stand here and say, well, it's because of the birds and all these other things. I think caterpillars are amazing. These are charismatic animals. They're large, they're colorful, they're surprising, they make us laugh. Um, they're things that I want to be able to go outside with other people and show them and, and see them and share their existence. This is a great ash sphinx. This is beautiful pink and yellow thing rearing up. And you can just go out on a walk in the fall and luck out, turn over a leaf, and there is this rearing monster. And that's an experience I think has a value in its own right. So we should care because caterpillars are fantastic. Um, but there are other reasons for those who that's not a good enough uh, answer. Um, these are twig mimic caterpillars that overwinter as caterpillars. Now, we've talked about how birds eat caterpillars, right? Um, we sort of know that in the background, that caterpillars are important. But sometimes it's nice to explore that in more detail. Um, two of these caterpillars are species, this one and this one, called Protobormia porcellaria. And it is very, very abundant um, in winter. It overwinters exposed on twigs. 
It dehydrates a little bit, so the freezing isn't as much of a problem. Um, but it's right out there every night, you know, 10 below, they survive. Um, anyone heard of golden crown kinglets? Tiny, tiny little birds that are in our forests when it's, you know, negative temperatures in the winter. No one really knew how they could possibly survive. I mean, they need a lot of energy to build up enough heat to survive these winters. Well, Bernd Heinrich did a study on them and opened up some kinglets and found that about 80% of what they ate was just a couple species of overwintering caterpillar. So this Protobormia porcellaria, that caterpillar right there, is responsible for kinglets in New England over winter. And um, you can link you know, cuckoos and the tent caterpillars and others like that. So you can look at these very specific uh, relationships. That's um, a much larger but another overwintering caterpillar called lytrosis. Um, sometimes when we tell stories of conservation, of um, struggles, of, of rare caterpillars, disappearing caterpillars, people um, react to that as something we should care about. Just the way we've always heard of tigers disappearing or rhinoceroses disappearing, something that we should be worried about. Uh, this is the Cecropia. Many of our giant silk moths are disappearing in the region. Uh, many of our sphinx moths are disappearing. It's not totally understood why, but one of the major culprits is a introduced parasitic fly that was introduced in 1909 to kill off gypsy moth caterpillars. Didn't work on the gypsy moths. We kept introducing it all the way up through the 1980s. Um, what happens, you have a big gypsy moth here, the fly reproduces in the gypsy moths, and then millions upon millions of them descend for two more generations on our native species, and they love the big guys. So in studies done on Cecropia in Massachusetts, they found 80 to 100% mortality from Compsolera. Um, so it's a miracle these things are still here at all. Um, and uh, you know, that's exactly the kind of story you hear at the end of a nature show. Uh, to sort of make you think, well, maybe we need to do something about this and look a little closer at these species. And given their moth is one of the largest flying insects in the country and something that has inspired many people as they open up their door in the morning, I think um, we should pay a little more attention to what's going on with these. But uh, for me, I think whether you really care about caterpillars or not, you have to acknowledge that they do. Um, most kids get inspired by these creatures, um, come to our tables in awe. Um, this little girl was singing to all of our caterpillars at the Children's Museum. And I think it's really important for us to cultivate a love of natural history of nature. And I think these insects are one way to do that. They can get close to these. They can develop personal ties to them. This isn't an animal that has to be far away viewed through binoculars. This isn't something that only exists in national parks. So. I think we should care about caterpillars because they are an amazing tool at introducing kids to caring and loving the natural world. Um, this little girl on the right was really nervous about caterpillars, or so I thought. Uh, it turned out she was nervous about me and other adults. Um, so the girl on the left, who had been hanging out at a show all day, uh, ended up befriending this imperial moth caterpillar and went and, and talked to this girl about it, and they became friends. Um, and these are some people at the lab in 2013 when we were in an apartment building in Keene, downtown Keene, uh, showing off their Cecropia caterpillars. So really, um, in the end, it's, it's just about inspiring people to look closer, make discoveries, and fall in love with the natural world. So that is what I had planned to talk about. Um, that's my information, but I would love to take questions. And you know, my whole life is caterpillars, so if you guys have things you want to know, I'm happy to, to chat. I'm curious if um, genet genetically modified plants are affecting the mm -hmm. caterpillar community. You hear about it with monarchs, mm -hmm. and I thought that was maybe more about nectaring, mm -hmm. but is it also affecting I can't say too much on specifics there. What I can say is most of, of insect conservation, most of what's causing you know, loss of populations and all of that comes down to unintended consequences of things that we do. So when you look at releasing parasitoids to control gypsies and how that's had a devastating effect, my only remark is that as we go into genetic engineering for the, the benefits and the, and the costs of it, we need to remember we don't know everything and that someday down the line we're going to see that there's a consequence we never expected. So tread carefully. Um, I think most of what's been worried about are Roundup Ready plants where they do a lot of pesticide spraying which will sort of remove host plants. Um, I think that is a problem. I'm mostly concerned about removing nectaring plants 
Um, most butterflies and moths are really, really good at finding their host plant. So this whole idea of that milkweed being something that's limiting monarch populations doesn't really sit well with what I know about caterpillars, and there's been recent studies that have shown it's probably not a limit, uh, a lack of milkweed, because monarchs can find that one sprout of milkweed growing in downtown Boston if they have to. But if they don't have nectar to migrate, if they don't have big open fields and prairies full of food to help them on their way, that's really going to limit uh, what they can do. And of course, they need milkweed too. Any other questions? Well, you must be concerned about invasive species then. Mm -hmm. So I, you might have noticed that I'm always trying to find sort of the positive spin on things. And I, I think that's because there are a lot of groups working to get rid of invasive species and talking about the problems of Asian longhorn beetles and all of this. And what I want to do is, is sort of um, acknowledge that, but not make people dislike it. We talked about good versus bad caterpillars. I don't want there to be any bad caterpillars. I want there to be caterpillars in unfortunate situations where we're not allowed to love them as much as we want to. <laughs> so um, when it comes to invasive plants, I grew up in Newton in this local park, and boy, was it full of invasives. I mean, buckthorn understories, but man, I found some cool stuff. I mean, there was philodendron cork bark tree that has this huge corky bark, and it's full of native spiders that use these folds of bark. Um, I found, and it you know, tore through a red maple swamp. It made the understory unstable. The red maples fell. This is all horrible stuff, destroying an environment. But boy, did I find some cool beetles using those dead red maples. So as a kid near a city, that's what I want to promote. I don't want um, someone to grow up learning about all the things that are going wrong or just learning about that, but to say, well, here's a dead tree. This is cool. What's it going to look like every month? What beetles are going to use it? Um, Calopanix pictus is this amazing tree that's been going through Boston. Leaves can be this big, covered with thorns, even on a mature tree, and uh, absolutely loved by flickers in the fall. A tree could have 15 flicker uh, birds in it eating the fruit. So I want people to have curiosity about non-natives and invasives at the same time that we work to control them and do what's best for our environment. I do think that for backyards, if you're looking to improve the diversity of creatures that use your property or property you're managing, I think it's much more valuable to remove invasives, replacing them with native plants. Certainly not getting rid of like coal properties that have native and invasives, but replacing what you can with native plants. Um, and probably leaving the chaos of insects mostly alone. So spraying for winter moths, if, if it's about your tree survival, that's probably worth doing. But at the same time, you are going to decrease the overall diversity of insects in your yard. Um, but taking out a buckthorn and putting in a, well, oak trees are probably the best, but oaks, cherries, poplars, these are all great things, um, will just make the land more vibrant and productive. Anything else I can help with? Well, thanks a lot, guys. <laughs>